Thanks for joining us this morning for the Age of the Entrepreneur, Tips, Trends, and the Truth. My name is Brian Moran. I'm the founder and CEO of Brian Moran and Associates. Uh, that doesn't mean a whole lot to you guys right now, but I've spent about 26, 26 years publishing magazines and newspapers for business owners. Um, I was at the Wall Street Journal, uh, Inc. Magazine, Entrepreneur Success. I think I might be the only salesperson that has been at, at all four of those publications. Uh, and then I ran uh, my own publishing company, and uh, among other magazines, I published the SBA's title for about eight or nine years. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our two panelists that are joining me today. Uh, they will introduce themselves, and what we'll do is we're going to talk a little bit about what's happening with uh, entrepreneurship and small business today. Um, we're going to ask a series of questions, I'll ask them, and um, at about 11.40 we'll open it up for any questions that you have. So uh, I'll, I'll give a final question, then anything you want to ask us, uh, feel free to do so. Um, okay, so John Meyer. Uh, John is a marketing leader at Company Corporation. Uh, he and his team basically help business owners incorporate their business anywhere in the country. Uh, he also happens to be married to a small business owner. What do you have, about 20, 10, 20 people in the company? About 20. 20 people in the company. So he knows firsthand the trials and tribulations of running a small business. Um, and he's actually a, a proud graduate of uh, Loyola University right here in Baltimore. Um, Jack Bianco is Deputy Director of Entrepreneurship at the U.S. Small Business Administration. Uh, he has a, a fancier bio. Jack leads many of the SBA's entrepreneurial outreach strategies. He works on intergovernmental and public-private partnerships to foster innovation and language and leverage public uh, resources. And uh, on the weekends, he tells me he can be found playing baseball on the fields of Maryland. So uh, with that, let's, uh, why don't we do this? What I'd like to do is, um, John, why don't you tell us like what you do on a day-to-day -day basis in working with business owners. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Brian mentioned, I work with entrepreneurs all across the country and actually all across the globe that are looking to incorporate in the United States. And uh, I work up in Wilmington, Delaware, so just up uh, 95. I work for a company. Uh, the parent company is called Corporation Service Company and it dates back to 1899. The two gentlemen that wrote the Delaware corporate laws founded this company. So they wrote the laws on like a Tuesday and started the company on like a Wednesday, Thursday. So a great example of uh, capitalism there. Uh, but the uh, small business brand is called the Company Corporation and I lead a team of professionals that help uh, entrepreneurs. We get about a million to a million and a half entrepreneurs that are coming to our websites uh, each and every year to learn more about incorporating, about starting a business, what type of business licenses that you need, and you can find uh, our websites, it's incorporate.com and llc.com. Uh, both were uh, registered basically in 1993, so uh, we're one of the pioneers in getting that service online. You might be familiar with some other uh, competitors that are out there, uh, LegalZoom, we play in the same space as LegalZoom as well as uh, Rocket Lawyer, which is a new uh, fast-growing company out of San Francisco. So uh, we work each and every day through uh, uh, offline strategies, so uh, direct response TV and radio, and then uh, uh, partnerships and affiliates that are driving traffic, as well as uh, digital, so paid search, SEO, uh, remarketing, a little bit of social, uh, so we, those are kind of the three buckets. It's digital, uh, direct response, TV, radio, and then affiliates and partners. Great. Jack, what are you, what are you doing at the SBA these days? A uh, lot. So, so for those of you that aren't familiar with the uh, U.S. Small Business Administration, we're an independent federal agency whose mission is to support uh, the nation's entrepreneurs, whether you're interested in entrepreneurship or actively uh, in the small business community. Uh, we're most known in we're, we're 60 years old this year. We were originally founded uh, to help underwrite a lot of lending throughout the, uh, the nation. So we have uh, hundreds of relationships with large banks, smaller banks, and as the financial world sort of evolves, the SBA is keeping up with that. 
We also do a ton of work um, trying to protect and enhance the small business buy from the U.S. government's perspective. And uh, my role includes uh, uh, one of the unique areas of SBA, which is where we partner uh, to provide mentorship, mm -hmm. training, and coaching. So that keeps me pretty active with folks from different sectors, such as uh, Brian and John and a lot of other folks, uh, including university leaders, nonprofit organizations, the evolving world of digital solutions as that relates to uh, mentorship. In total, SBA has about 70 district offices, including one about six miles uh, from our current hotel here. Uh, we have about 2,000 funded locations, again, the universities and nonprofits. An average city might have about six SBA offices in it, whether it's us directly or one of our partners. Um, we guarantee, I mentioned our lending, uh, every day of the year we underwrite approximately $300 million every workday of the year. So a lot of underwriting throughout the nation, so we take it pretty seriously during economic downturns and how the nation tries to keep and use uh, small businesses entrepreneurship as somewhat as the historical stabilizer of the economy, which is really important, especially as we talk to other uh, global leaders. And uh, finally, then we're deploying in that mentor world about 15,000 men and women uh, that provide training workshops at public libraries, are doing things with uh, online MOOCs, massively open online courses, and other sort of cool tools. So that keeps me pretty busy interacting with different parts of the government, corporate American mm. partnerships, or directly with our mentors. Great. Uh, before I get into the questions, just I want to make sure that I, um, I ask the appropriate ones. Just by a show of hands, how many people here are small business owners? Okay small business owners. How many people here work for companies or with companies, like with small businesses? So you either work with small business, all right. So a lot of you guys are, are targeting small business owners. So we can frame our answers accordingly. Um, Jack, why don't I start with you? What is the state of entrepreneurship right now in the US? Sure, sure. A general so, question. Yeah, so it's an interesting dialogue. If you, if you uh, read a lot about entrepreneurship, the economy, on one hand, you'll see some studies coming out, and a lot of this was publicized over the last uh, month or two, some studies coming out of organizations like the Kauffman Foundation or other organizations that are active in the small business community talking about entrepreneurship is on the decline. Uh, we historically find the opposite, though. During an economic downturn, more people become freelancers, become entrepreneurs, and we usually see an incline. So the academics would probably argue a definition of entrepreneurship churning in small business small businesses. So at times we might have right now a, a slight decline with some business failures, honestly, but we find more people are becoming active. We also find a lot of interest from younger generations that uh, where they may have wanted to work for a well-known brand in the future, whether they're in school or they're sort of working on their career plans, now it's almost automatic that the uh, teenagers and 20-year-olds want to become an entrepreneur. So we're seeing a lot of interest in people tinkering with entrepreneurship, and I think we're going to talk a little bit later about sort of the, uh, the new tools we have to do startups. Mm -hmm. So we're finding, you know, this is a, it's a dynamic economy we're in. A lot of the PhDs that run SBA's Office of Advocacy, if you're really into numbers, the SBA's Office of Advocacy is an independent research arm. Uh, so they put out a lot of numbers about these issues. And when I debate with them sort of in the hallways at SBA headquarters, they talk a lot about a reset of the American economy. We're probably not under an ebb and flow. We're going to go back to an old economy, an old reality. But we're more in a, a global reset. So we're going to see new forms of entrepreneurship or what they're saying. OK. John? Just, just like uh, Jack was saying, we, we see uh, small businesses each day incorporate at our sites. So we're a good barometer to see how the economy is doing from a small business standpoint. And as Jack mentioned, when you see the economic downturn, the actual small business rate actually goes up. So we start to see that uh, increase. So people that maybe have been in a job, maybe uh, laid off, uh, maybe their 401k has grown in a, in a surging stock market and it's starting to go down, they'll now take that leap and uh, start their own business. So we certainly see a rise uh, in small business activity now. Uh, the other interesting thing from a entrepreneurship standpoint is kind of the maker economy. So you start to see people that are starting to take their hobbies, uh, Etsy shops, um, you know, different things like that where they have the tools now that they can operate their own small business from their home and they've got those platforms that they can now start their own business uh, through 
Etsy shops or even starting up, uh, let's say, a crowdfunding through Kickstarter or Indiegogo, something like that, where they get that fuel to mm -hmm. uh, get their small business up and running. Yeah, Brian, that reminds me. Can we take a quick pulse where folks are kind of from? Because I, I think we're going to have a lot of good examples. We get sort of a, a view across the nation and want to give some of our examples pretty relevant to where you all are from. So, all right. uh, how about Baltimore or Baltimore area? Uh, DC? Anywhere else? New York. New York? Okay. Philly, right, so New mid, York. Mid Atlantic and North. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There you go. Cool. It's true, though. The, the economy can vary widely for small business owners depending on what area you're from. Some of the stuff that we talk about up here is definitely not applicable down south, Midwest, or the West Coast because they're dealing with their own issues. Um, and speaking of that, um, as somebody who's spent half, I've spent half my career uh, as an entrepreneur and the other half in corporate America. I will tell you that being an entrepreneur is definitely more rewarding for me, uh, but it's the, it's the roller coaster. You know, if, uh, if you don't like roller coasters, maybe entrepreneurship is not for you. But it brings up a question that we ask all the time when we talk to companies, and that's the, the most basic question, what keeps you up at night? So I'll start with John. What, in, in, in all of the dealings that you have with business owners, what do you find are the one or two things that are keeping most business owners up? Well, I'm going to start with uh, my focus group of one, which is uh, my wife as a small business owner. It's probably the easiest thing to say, what's keeping her up at night. Uh, we also have two kids under two, so that tends to keep <laughs> us up quite a bit as well. But, uh, you know, payroll, if you've got employees and every two weeks you have to hit that payroll, uh, that's certainly going to keep you up at night. Uh, beyond the stresses of, uh, you know, payroll and making that rent payment, which are usually your two largest expenses as a small business owner, uh, what I start to see is, uh, you know, there's questions about health insurance. Uh, there's a lot of confusion uh, around the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. uh, with small business owners. And then also compliance um, from the standpoint of uh, registrations, licenses, permits, do I have what I need in my local jurisdiction to actually do the business, or am I gonna get stuck in some type of situation where uh, authorities are gonna come after me and give me a fine? So when you talk about payroll and rent, I think it's, it's, it's a larger subject than that is cash flow. Mm -hmm. I mean, that to me is, is and, and I'll let you, I know you I think you're going to talk about compliance, but I think a larger issue is that it's the um, kind of the uncertainty of cash flow. And if you're not watching, you know, the payables, if you're, if you're one day late, they're knocking on your door. But the receivables, I watch so many times where business owners allow a net 30 to become a net 60 because they don't keep their eye on it. Or they say, you know, my, my client, you know, wants to... Uh, pay late and I don't want to lose the business so I'm going to allow that but then they don't go back and they say okay well how is this going to affect the cash flow of my business right I mean that's certainly yeah I think that that's certainly ca cash flow is one of those key words for, for small business owners I think that they say uh, you know that's that's where they're and it's not even the the, the payables end of it it's the receivables mm -hmm. right Jack what about you yeah so so we see uh a lot of macro issues and then uh, when I'm able to sort of get out across America here sort of more at, at, at diners and coffee shops when I get a chance to uh, sit down with some business leaders so uh, some probably non, not surprising things financing uh, across the board um, an exploration of new financing models you know where in the traditional sense credit plays a role now whether you have a great idea not a great credit track history uh, or the opposite you know, end of the spectrum, how are people looking at you? Again, whether it's your traditional Mr. and Mrs. Banker or new models of crowdfunding and peer lending and everybody's sort of enamored with uh, angel and venture capital nowadays, whether or not they're in that sort of market of what uh, investors are looking at. Um, uh, John mentioned sort of having kids, so we're also trying from the U.S. government perspective, not only traditional business lending, but realizing that entrepreneurs are a really unique subset, so they're balancing mortgages, business mm -hmm. needs, uh, uh, family, finances, and that stuff. And we found, obviously, during the sort of early beginning of the uh, economic downturn that those realities were really sort of uh, causing a lot of stress in families and, and, and the economy as a whole. Um, 
talent, keep on you know talking to folks of all types, you know how to uh, recruit talent and employees and retain folks, not only from a skill set, mm -hmm. but whether those folks are going to be local or mm -hmm. folks are going to be uh, uh, virtual workers across the nation. How do you deal with sort of needs if you're going to if you're lucky enough to find the right talent for your firm? How are you going to retain folks um, based on their interests, their lifestyle, and then some demographics? younger workers and cultural norms versus some uh, older workers who are re-entering the, the job force. But we find that small businesses, if they have a game plan, they know they're going to pursue markets, they're lucky enough to have financing, they know it's the team that drives the success. I suspect the same thing with you all. You know, you really need to have your um, your key players in, in, in place and hopefully you, you, you uh, retain them because competitors are scouting for talent. So, you know, there's a lot of dialogue about that. We find a lot of people are going to our coaches and our mentors and our universities talking about attracting talent, retaining them and building and growing that firm so people are poised for growth. So uh, one of the things we hear is, is do I hire talent or do I train it, right? So, do, you know, what's, that's the question. Hiring the talent is going to cost you more up front. They can hit the ground running shorter learning curve. Train the talent, less money, deeper learning curve, and you do run the risk of them leaving you after a couple of years if, uh, if they find a better job elsewhere. I, I, I want to just do a follow-up on the financing part, though, because this is another, I think, a key uh, topic that I hear everywhere I go in terms of what's keeping business owners up at night. And there was that expression when you were starting a business, the, the FFF, friends, family, and fools right, uh, where you got your financing. So whether it was a, a home equity line of credit or credit cards or personal savings uh, or borrowing from a relative, you know, a lot of that went away in 2008. And I think we're, it's, you don't see it coming back very much. I mean, certainly, you know, credit limits are tougher to get. They're, they're much more in check. Same with the home equity lines of credit, definitely not what they were 10, 12 years ago. So is, is crowdfunding and this peer-to-peer -peer lending that we hear about, like Lending Club, is that taking the place of the friends, family, and fools in, in terms of startup financing? Yeah, um, so I, I think it will capture part of that in sort of the digital world we're, we're in. Last week, um, the uh, Security and Exchange Commission partnered with the SBA to host a uh, uh, sort of a round table or sort of community feedback about some of these issues. We still have some stuff. We, meaning the SEC, has some issues to still execute as it relates to the Jobs Act and crowdfunding and that stuff as Congress still grapples with that. But I do think it'll sort of be a digital way to engage with those uh, friends and family, folks who are sort of used to uh, the PayPal reality. And I know we have PayPal presence here in Baltimore. We have coders from PayPal here. Uh, I can't remember why, but PayPal has a presence here. So that's great for Baltimore. But I, yeah, I think it'll become easier. I, the government's obviously concerned about the tail end of it. If folks aren't following through, who do you hold liable? Whether it's, you know, you don't get your money back or we saw with some apps that sold for billions of dollars, those earlier, early crowdfunded sort of investors were sort of asking, you know, wasn't my early contribution sort of supposed to grow with this later sale? So folks have a lot of questions about these issues, but I think it, it shows immense promise and we see the growth overseas in some markets that aren't, aren't as regulated, so we'll see how it plays out here. But I think that's that's definitely a trend and a reality. We're, we're going to figure that stuff out. Okay. I'm going to switch now to data and information. And, John, I'm going to ask you this question. You know, there's a lot of talk about data, right, and the availability of data, like never before. I think um, I saw one statistic that 90, I think it's 90 percent of all of the world's information has been generated in the last two years. To me, that's just a lot more hay. When you think about, when I think about data and information, I think about the needles that will help me in my business and where do I find it. So when I hear all of this, you know, there are millions of websites that are available to small business owners to help them run better businesses, it just means it's a lot more hay, right? A lot more hay to find the same needles. So I'll start with you, John. Where are business owners, do you see, uh, going for, uh, to get information today? Like, are there reliable sources? Are they, are, they, are they sticking with traditional media? Are they going online? And if they're going online, where are they going? I think there's a lot of different uh, spots that they're going that you could go to kind of the old school method, which was, hey, go see a SCORE mentor, uh, which is a great organization, which uh, is in a lot of SBA offices where you might go find the mentor, find research documents. Uh, so you've got that, you've got your associations, but 
really, uh, you know, we're at a digital conference here. Uh, the best spot to go to is Google, right? So what is the search volume that you're seeing from Google Analytics? How many people are searching in a uh, geo-targeted area for, you know, coffee or um, those types of things? So really from a data standpoint, if you're researching a small business and you want to see what the need is or what type of uh, pain you can solve, I mean, there's no better spot than uh, opening up a Google Analytics account and uh, just seeing some of the, the trends that are there uh, through Google and the search engines. Yeah. yeah. So really interested to hear from you all about this because I think this is a reality sort of you all are living not only as sort of digital strategists, but I suspect that your customers are asking how to manage data. I suspect they're looking at you now more to say, besides sort of getting SEO on the website, maybe in your world sort of advertising and, and sort of creating a digital footprint, uh, small businesses are, are, are sort of beyond saying, knowing that it's important, but saying, okay, show me also where you're gonna help me convert customers into sales or improve relationships. So really do uh, wanna hear any suggestions you all have or realities in that stuff because, uh, yeah, we hear folks talking about uh, even folks that are sort of um, late uh, adopters talking about the tools that they know are available, not as comfortable, still trying to figure out is that something you delegate to an intern uh, mm -hmm. or is that something you sort of recruit a talent for or is it something you outsource or build an intern capacity, internal capacity. Uh, the government as an entity is grappling with this too. So I've got a lot of peers at other agencies and the SBA itself is trying to figure out how do we utilize uh, data that comes in from different sources if you're really into any type of uh, government data, uh, including for your own needs, a lot of stuff we have with Census and IRS can be used for commercial purposes and that stuff to understand markets. Uh, you can go to data.gov. Uh, I think all the agencies have APIs and other sort of data uh, ready sets that you can sort of pull in. And I, I see a lot of sort of commercial tool sets pulling those things in. I think your customers really be interested in demographic data and other information uh, we have. I was, I was reading an article the other day, and I can't remember if it was out of New York Times or, or maybe my hometown, Buffalo News. It was talking about some firms in Toronto that were using some of this place-based data. You know, it wasn't necessarily the Foursquare check-in data, but it was for venues that are hosting free Wi-Fi and in the small print that not many of us, including myself, read. It was talking about you tap into the free Wi-Fi, they're going to repackage that and kick that out. So, uh, and I, there was a couple leading firms out of Toronto that were doing this, uh, according to the story, saying they're repackaging that. Now the small business owner is saying, okay, I want micro data on, you know, my likely customers and my current customers mm -hmm. and that stuff because of this sort of check-in or free Wi-Fi uh, source uh, data. And it was really helping people understanding the demographics, their interest and in connecting a, a couple dots without handing over literally the customer username, I, I still think, you know, the nation and with, with uh, public sector breaches with NSA and other issues there, there's still sensitivity about that. But, you know, that bold, uh, bold brave new world is clearly evolving around us. Yeah. Did you just get in a plug for Buffalo? Yes, I snuck it in there. <laughs> I've known Jack for a while. I think he, you, you get that in every, every time <laughs> I hear you speak, there's always a, an, a Buffalo. <laughs> they must pay you like a, right, for every time? Okay. Um, and, and I agree with, with your assessments. One thing I'll say is that um, I, I'm seeing a lot more community engagement. People are now a lot more comfortable asking questions in communities, whether it's uh, like a LinkedIn community or a vertical industry community about, you know, where do you find, you know, information, whether it's practical, and we'll get into technology in a second, or it's about employee issues, or it's about finding new customers. I think people are starting to get that they can actually put a question out there and somebody in the next town or the next state or the next country is going to be able to provide them with an answer. So we're st I'm seeing a lot more of that through that social engagement, which we'll also talk about. Yeah. But, but let's, let's, and let's talk about finding information. You know, there's a lot of talk about technology and small business. I actually just wrote a blog post about it. And I think in the last 25 to 30 years, technology alone has done more to help people start, manage, and grow businesses than any other factor. You know, the fact that it's leveled the playing field for businesses. I think I said it was like, uh, it was akin to uh, 
uh, David finding a you know fully loaded you know supersonic uh, slingshot uh, to go up against Goliath, but that's that's really what's happening. Um, so with that, with the kind of the evolution of, of technology moving faster and faster, how do small business owners keep up with it? Like you know, three D printing right is is coming out right now. What does that mean to the average small business owner? Like, what what trends should they be following? Um, you know, John, you talk about like scheduling apps and logic apps to automate your basic business functions to free up more time for your business. Talk a little bit about how technology is playing a role today in helping small businesses start, manage, grow, and even sometimes save their companies. I think uh, when you look at technology, and Brian just mentioned uh, logic apps, how many people use Zapier or Ift, which anybody have a Nest uh, thermostat in their home? Or, um, there you go. There you go. Uh, well, with uh, those types of, uh, they're basically smart homes, but you start to think about as a small business owner, you have all these apps that you can start to set up logic for your business. So. Uh, a good example is on the app, which is if, it's if, then, then that. Uh, let's say it's December 1st, you have decorated your home with Christmas lights. Now there's a section in Baltimore, is it Hamden that has like all the crazy over the top Christmas lights? So you could set something up that says, okay, December 1st at five o'clock, I want you to turn on the power to all my Christmas lights. So you could be working, you could be down at Fells Point or over in Federal Hill, your lights come on, right? And everybody drives by your house and sees the Christmas lights. So that's an example of a, like a smart home. Uh, same thing with the Nest thermostat. You can basically set your thermostat so you, know, you leave work or a home security system. You can you know, use your iPhone or mobile device to control that. Think about from a small business owner standpoint, you can start to set up logic from a technology standpoint that, um, so I work with a company which is called Squarespace, which is based in uh, New York City. They do websites for uh, small business owners and they have uh, a partnership with Xero, which is an invoice and accounting system. And it's all automated. So like somebody, you set up a website, you sell something on your site, and all the financial data is just going into, it's all automated. Right? Uh, so when you think about technology, how do you make your life easier based on those logic uh, rules and parameters that you can set up through apps and the ever-changing technology that we mm -hmm. keep seeing each, each day that comes out? So and now I'll ask you a follow-up question. There, there are some apps that people have said, oh, Brian, this was made for you. Like this, this will change your life, it will make it you know, so much easier to access data, et cetera, et cetera. I've downloaded this one app three or four times. How many people use Evernote, right? I, I mean, they tell me you have to use it. I've never opened it up. I, I, I don't know what the, the, the um, blockage is there, but it's like, it, you know, it, I guess the pain point isn't great enough for me in my life to say, okay, I need to figure out this technology. And they say, you can learn it in like five minutes. But there's some kind, and I see that with a lot of business owners and technology, that if you just take the time, and that's always a question, they'll always say, I don't have time. But that's really just a, a catchphrase for something larger that's, they're, they're just trying to put out fires is what they're doing. But you say, this technology can help you in your business, it will change the way you do business, and they don't do anything about it. But I think you've got to find what works for you, so, you know. Do you have Dropbox on? I do. So, I do. I love that. You know, Dropbox works for you in that um, maybe you upload your contacts from LinkedIn into Dropbox or you have all your photos of your kids and travels and everything that go right in the Dropbox. That's an app that works for you. Evernote doesn't. So from a small business standpoint, you just find you can't use everything that's out there, right? Right. Uh, so you just try and find the three or four key pieces that you build your foundation around. So maybe Dropbox is that one key resource, or maybe two, three other ones that are out there. Mm -hmm. Jack, what do you think? Yeah. So it, it's definitely a pain point that we hear from a lot of small businesses, how to manage with their time, 
Uh, some folks are definitely intimidated by the, the amount of data or the complexity uh, of uh, market, even market opportunities, whether it's local, expanding into a different sort of realm, whether it's product or service oriented, or a lot of folks are talking about uh, global markets, but just this sort of pressure and crush of how to manage uh, data information, uh, customer relationships, contact information. So. Uh, we really do uh, encourage folks to tinker. Uh, our mentors are really, you know, don't push any type of product, but they definitely do say if you're not managing or addressing technology needs, you know, uh, it's going to be a very difficult battle to win. Um, John was talking a little bit sort of about devices, and we, we've got this sort of growing trend towards makers and tinkerers in, um, across the nation, including in Baltimore. Baltimore has a lot of great sort of uh, maker fairs in the area, as does the expanded uh, uh, Maryland region. And definitely for the folks that go up towards New York City, you've got some leading uh, uh, makers like uh, MakerBot, which is the mm -hmm. producer, one of the industry leaders of uh, 3D printing and had an opportunity to tour that, uh, which is really amazing to sort of see that production uh, out there in Brooklyn. Uh, you also have, if folks haven't checked out Quirky, one of my sort of new favorites, sort of a platform of tinkers and, and, and that stuff, they're in uh, Chelsea and New York City. So you're seeing a lot of folks sort of exhausting interests or just you know professional makers that are creating devices, consumers, businesses, enterprise, everybody's looking for smarter ways of doing things. Uh, so whether you're using some of these uh, apps or, or even hardware and that stuff, a lot more folks are, are doing that. John mentioned Squarespace and their partnership with Zero. I need to check out Zero. But a lot of folks, in terms of just the common stuff of managing your finances with tools, you know, produced by Intuit or FreshBooks and that stuff is really important for folks. But folks are, from what I hear, looking for that integration. They don't want to learn 30 different tools on top of their managing of people, managing of customers and that stuff. So there's, there's a need, and I, I think in the marketplace, more folks are building on top of or integrating uh, tools, hopefully, for that small business owner. And we often talk about small business owners uh, work 18 hours a day to avoid an eight hour nine to five job. So really time <laughs> is precious. You all are an interesting bunch. And uh, we just want to try to keep you sane. A lot of that is done in the, the marketplace and what you all are doing for your small business customers. Uh, let, let's move on to social media. And I'm cognizant of the time. Hopefully you have questions for us because I'm going to be asking you. Um, but let's talk a little bit about content marketing. Um, there's a lot of talk about it in the marketplace. Content is king. You've got to get you know, your knowledge out there to people who are looking for it via social media. So what does that mean to the average small business owner? I mean, how much are they embracing social media as a tool to create content and share it with, I mean, do they, are, they, are they advanced enough to understand that this is a vehicle that will allow them to showcase their expertise, connect with influencers, experts, customers, partners, vendors, or that they simply see social media as a sales tool. Like I just want to broadcast my, what I have on special this week and hopefully somebody buys it. I think uh, from a small business standpoint and also just from our marketing standpoint, uh, content is all about telling a story. So. Uh, we work with a local entrepreneur in uh, Wilmington. Uh, we sponsor a project which is called Founders Films. And we go out and we interview uh, people that have founded and started a company. So we uh, just sat down with uh, David Cohen, who uh, runs Techstars, which is a huge uh, accelerator. Uh, Steve Blank, uh, who's out in uh, Stanford, but uh, the father of the lean startup. Uh, and we've talked to you know, a whole host of different entrepreneurs on how did you start your business, what are the challenges, you, know, you founded this, how do you go from founder to kind of CEO of your business, and there's a story there. And we actually, uh, one of them I sat in on, which was uh, we sat down with uh, Jack or John Bogle, who started Vanguard, I know there's probably some T. Rowe Price people maybe in the room since we're... Uh, here or Leg Mason, but uh, Vanguard's, how many people are familiar with Vanguard 401k uh, index funds? So we sat down with him and uh, it was a fascinating conversation, just his mindset of how he started his business. So there's a story there that becomes the content and then you're sharing that through uh, YouTube. So for us, it's not a story about uh, 
hey, you should incorporate with the company corporation. It's a story about entrepreneurs. It's the challenges that they've had. And then we kind of have a side uh, kind of halo effect with it. Uh, and we see it as kind of just a mission uh, as a service that we can bring a story out uh, to entrepreneurs out there um, in the space. The uh, thing that, uh, how many people like, have looked at Instagram or Facebook over like, the last two days? Uh, when you think about what did people post over the weekend on Facebook, it was for, for us in Wilmington, Pennsylvania, it was people going to farms, apple picking with their kids. It was people at the beach for the last like, great weekend of the summer, and it was probably pictures of food, right? So those are like the core, it's like kids, uh, food, beach. and the and beach. Like the beach. Uh, so you start to think about uh, small business owners, and um, I was just looking at somebody that was using Vine, which I check in on every once in a while, and it's a restaurant that is basically using Vine just to kind of pan over their daily menu items. So it's just using that as kind of a broadcast item to say, hey, this is what we have as specials. I don't know what their following in is, but I thought that was interesting. Wall Street Journal uses it as a pan across the daily newspaper saying, mm -hmm. hey, here's the top stories of the day. So I think from a small business standpoint, it's like, wh what's your story? What's the story of your business? Maybe the story of your customers, and how do you share that through the different uh, channels? I'm a wise man, so I'm going to yield my time back to Brian and actually one of our audience members on this topic, because honestly, they're my mentors in social media. I try to do a little bit of this as a public servant, but. Uh, Brian is really great at this, and, and, and one of our audience members, uh, Shashi, has, has done an immense amount of jobs sort of connecting with people. And your stories, I think, I, I still learn about how you see small businesses using social media beyond just pushing out a notice, really, to be the reality and probably yeah. the future. They're getting better, but it's still, you know, we, um, I, I think in 2009, I did the first of about four or five social media panels at the SBA conference. And what was amazing is in 2009, I felt like it was social media 101 for small business owners. Like this is how you use it. This is why you should use it. It's it's not a trend. You know, it's something that's evolving. It's it, it's changing the way that the world communicates and gathers information. That was 2009. In 2013, we're having almost the exact same conversation. It goes back to this: if you're targeting small business owners or you're trying to feel what their pain points are. They will tell you um, th the most obvious answer that, or the most common answer that they give is, "I don't have time for I don't have time for social media." You know, it, we treat it as a means to an end, and right now it's not it's not in the playbook of things that we want to do. If if they're not using it, if they are, you know, the question is, are they using it right? So the, the opportunity for you as marketers to small business, or if you or if you're working with them, it, it's going to be getting them to really understand how to use social media in their business and if they're using it properly. I see a ton of people, and Shashi, I'd love your just two cents on this, but I see a ton of people using it, but they're using it for the wrong reasons. They're not talking to the right people. You know, the two key words in social media, engagement, amplification, right? Engagement, it's not a, you know, traditional advertising and marketing was a monologue. You advertised in newspapers, radio, television, print, to tell people about your product or service. If, so, you know, and, and the big branding, but there was some direct response advertising where there was a call to action. Call an 800 number in the days of early internet, visit this website, use this special code to track it. Um, and that all, that's been completely flipped over and now it's a full on dialogue. You know, and it starts with the customers. It's, and that's what small businesses are coming to, they're trying to come to grips with. You know, they're still at, the legacy advertising in the yellow pages or the local penny savers, which may be good for some people, but I think it's limited. They don't understand that these conversations about their restaurant, their product, their service are taking place online without them. What do you think? Thank you for giving me some time. I'm only <laughs> frustrating in this because my previous job used to be an evangelist for small businesses. I think the trend that I've seen is uh, credibility. And most people think it's still like something that the kids do. Right to your point, uh, right, and to John's point, people look at pictures all the time, and their audience is looking at pictures. So how do you connect it back? I think the first step is to tell them like, 
not everything is going to lead directly to a customer walking in, but it will be word of mouth or word of mouth. So if somebody sees a picture, they share it with their friends, and then they walk into the restaurant. The second thing is, if you ever have, haven't seen this already, like Google has a paper that's called Zero Moment of Truth. There's a chart there that tells you the percentage of attribution that you can give to different channels. And the highest attribution is towards the end of the channel, which is when the person actually walks into the business. That's a direct contact. But it doesn't mean that you just like stand outside with a sign and say like, hey, this channel is the best that's working and nothing else, right? So if you show the channel, say it's like people are going to check at least three different channels before mm -hmm. they actually come into the business. And one of them is definitely social and it's like almost front and center in this uh, mix. That's what they have to realize. Like, hey, tell your story with pictures. Like if you uh, if you've gone to an apple picking yard and you're a chef and you post those pictures and say, come to the restaurant and have this. The second thing is linking to their website. Mm -hmm. Most often, like even if it's Instagram or otherwise, put a context to them. You should be, I mean, a small business should be proud of the fact that they are a small business. Where can they find more information? <coughs> That's very important. And the third thing is reputation and user generating. Encourage people with signs to take pictures, mm -hmm. give them a hashtag that they can do that. So I think that's the way to tell them like your success is measured on all these three things. And it's not a choice anymore. You probably have to do it because your audience is already doing these things. I hope that's helpful. There you go. Thank you very much. Let me open it up to the audience. Uh, questions that you have about running a small business, targeting small businesses. Do we not cover something that you wanted to ask? This would be a good time. There's a question. Yeah. I'm starting a small business, and clearly one of my gaps is how do I address my marketing portfolio or social media side? And I come to SBA, and they say, well, we're not going to do so our mentors take on a couple different sort of uh, profiles. One, you might be, a, uh, if you're through our university affiliated network, you might be a business school professor or instructor or something like that. So you might have more of a classic uh, business startup uh, type uh, approach. We do have some specialty uh, universities that are into manufacturing or technology to a certain extent, but that's industry focused and, and what you're asking is kind of pretty broad, you know, whether digital or you need digital. Uh, a digital firm or need digital. Um, others are volunteers. Uh, they're a wide spectrum, but more so a lot of Main Street type assistance, honestly. And then we have some specialty categories towards veteran entrepreneurs, et cetera, et cetera. But to answer your question directly, so we, we kind of as a wholesaler, if you will, as a government that sort of supports grantees and other organizations are trying to look at it just like a venture capitalist might look at how, to, how does his or her sort of portfolio need additional education. So we do some train the trainer type stuff, honestly, and within their micro organizations, they're looking at introducing some of the mentors or coaches who might not totally have been exposed to this. They don't try to solve all these issues though, so we're not trying to compete with the marketplace Honestly, we're trying to arm people so they're dangerous enough to be your informed customers and aggravate you a little bit, but ultimately they'll be your customers because you know, what you do is so important. We, we, we can't replace that. We're not building any networks to compete with that, and, and I don't think that would be wise. So we just try to do train the trainer type stuff, introduce them to social media. We have some internal stuff, intranets. Uh, to expose them, but whether it's a CPA, a lawyer, or a digital strategist, ultimately, the end of the session tends to be, if you need more information, here, here's how to engage this industry or community, and then people have some questions on how do you find a good vendor, how do you trust them, how do you follow through, what are pay rates, and those things. So it's generally always introduction, honestly, uh, but we have a struggle, like a lot of widespread networks, of introducing people to cutting edge issues. Questions? So for businesses that are starting up, is it better to bring in uh, like a 1099 employee and do just per project contracting? Or do you see some of them just right out of the gate um, hiring full time? What's the success ratio of the complaint? You're talking payroll. Yeah, I think, I think it starts, you know, the, the, it all starts before you open your doors or before you you know, say I'm, 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 I've started my business. Um, you, got, you have to have a plan, you know, because hiring a full-time employee or even hiring an independent contractor is going to cost you money. And especially with startups, 
cash is that finite resource that you know you have to build in for mistakes and you have to say okay maybe my revenue is not going to come as fast as I thought I mean I see this with probably 95 percent of the business plans that I review the revenues way too high or ambitious as I like to tell them and the expenses they they don't they don't put in enough for variable expenses and so each business is going to be different it's going to depend on how you grow your business but I think the logical planning of when to hire an employee and and where I want to take my business and a lot of times one of the things we didn't talk about but it's really fundamental to understanding this market is are you a small business owner or are you an entrepreneur you know it's amazing how many people don't know you know uh, uh, to me a small business owner is somebody who really values that work-life balance right they love to coach their kids sports on the weekends or go away and and that that work-life balance is a priority to them they'll see a lot of ex uh, 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 purchases as expenses you know money coming out of their pocket so if I have to hire somebody that means it's less money for me an entrepreneur is going to see those purchases as investments to growing their business and it's it's you you could have the exact same business on paper but one person's an entrepreneur and the other one's a small business owner the scary part is when you don't know what you are because you come to these forks in the road every business does if you get a little bit of success you come to a fork and it says do I hire employees or do I not hire employees do I open a second location do I buy out my competitor do I make a capital investment into my company and what I tell businesses are that you, you only limit your upside if you stay as a small business owner like you know that's kind of that safe path because it, it's not going to hurt your business the only way it hurts you is if somebody comes in steals an opportunity away from you and eventually steals your customers but when you start to make decisions as an entrepreneur you're making investments into your company if you don't have a real plan for that it's like you're going higher up on the ladder and the and the fall is much further like you've committed to a lease in, in a building you've opened a second location you know my plumber was about to buy his competitor for about six hundred thousand dollars and after about two hours of talking to him he didn't do it because all he really wanted to do was manage his existing business he wanted better customers you know higher paying customers but this would have been an albatross around his neck he would have spent the next two or three years trying to figure out how to get back to where he was so to your question I think that's a larger issue of what type of business owner are you and then you'll decide is that an investment in my company to grow it to take it to a certain level or is it an expense and where is it taking me because I'm capping I'm capping my upside a lot of business owners do that they don't realize it you know but but they make decisions not to engage in certain activities like I said you know expanding their business but you don't want to expand your expenses Anyone want to touch that? I kind of I get on a pedestal yeah. every now and then. I apologize. You know, uh, <laughs> we're all seeing an evolving tools um, for folks that aren't familiar with PEOs, professional employer organizations. A dominant one out there is called Inspirity out of uh, Texas. So, sort of outsourcing your employees. Uh, obviously, I, I should mention being from the government, uh, uh, the uh, healthcare issues that are continuing to evolve in those considerations on whether somebody's an employee, a part time, ten ninety nine in those issues but we find from uh, healthcare management people management liabilities and those things there's a growing interest in PEOs across the nation I'm not sure if anybody's ever considered that we're not recommending it necessarily but obviously it's something that small business owners whether they're deciding whether they want to be an entrepreneur an employer or the next biggest thing um, are considering FYI for anybody who's interested in continuing to learn about healthcare, uh, healthcare.gov, the SBA at sba.gov hold, holds I think three webinars a week so we'll communicate with you, you can submit questions in, in those things so please avail yourselves of those educational opportunities as you try to address healthcare needs for your yourself or your employees. Another question. You did a pretty good job answering. All right, I have one more question so we got two questions left. I'll ask one, and then uh, if anyone else wants to ask one, they can. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, and we, we touched on it uh, a little bit today, but it's the startup market. It's easier today. I mean, in, in terms of starting a business, 
I remember I started my business, even the first company I started was 12 years ago. You know, it took me almost a month to register my company, to, you know, build a, a website, to, um, you know, set, to basically get up all of the, uh, the things that I needed to do, business cards and whatnot. Today, it seems like I can do all of that in a single day. Um, what is the state? I mean, are, are people aware of all of the resources that are available to them to, for how easy it is to start a business? Um, and I think you would probably know this better than almost anybody, uh, John. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Like, uh, you know, I see all those, those the bundling of services. Sure. It's almost like, like a kit that says, you want to start a business, open this kit, you know, follow everything in it, and you'll be up and running tomorrow. Yeah, I think the holy grail for every corporate marketer out there in the small business space is to come up with business in a box, and nobody's... Nobody's done it successfully yet. And I think, Brian, you make a good point that you can start a business in a matter of minutes, but the real question is the planning that goes behind the business. That's not a matter of minutes. So you're going through that exercise of your business planning, what you want to do, and you're spending time thinking about the strategy and mm -hmm. how you're going to operate that business. And that's an ongoing exercise that you do, and there's no stop and start point. That just goes on forever. But when you think about starting a business from the logistics, from the functions of it, I think the challenges are people don't know where to turn or what they need to uh, get to get that business up and running. But when you think about it, you can incorporate, you can get a business license, you can get business cards, you can get a domain name, you can get a website, and you can get all of that up and running, completed, some of that filing work will take um, you know, maybe a couple days or a couple weeks, but you can get all those tasks done by various um, providers in 30 minutes or less, and you could be off and running, and you could say, I have my business, and I'm going out to market. I mean, you could set up, I mean, if you really wanted to start a business and you had time, and you just wanted to sell your time, um, Airbnb, that's turned a bunch of people into uh, real estate uh, small business, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just leasing out the bedroom or uh, house, uh, Task Rabbit, um, Uber, Uber Lyft, uh, just driving people back and forth. It's created a whole new class of entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. are out there. So really, it's, a, it's the best time ever to be an entrepreneur with the technology that you have available to you. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think another interesting thing uh, for me is that uh, with all these tools and opportunities, the discussion seems to have shifted aggressively, you know, to start with the customer in mind. Mm -hmm. So whether you're into the, you're a disciple of lean startups, or if you're uh, the unofficial uh, member of the unofficial mayor of Baltimore, Mario Armstrong's Never Settle Club, sort of these folks are sort of talking about, you know, start with the customer in mind. And, and really at the startup phase, you all are well poised because folks are not only talking about incorporation, but if everybody's talking about whether you're at a hackathon or you're starting you know, a, a different type of business, your digital strategy right up front with incorporation, talking to the lawyer and that stuff. So I think you, you all are getting a lot of uh, earlier inquiries and that stuff. Folks are still trying to figure out digital and advertising and capturing customers, but it's a, it's a, it's a huge need and I, I see a lot of growth in the market that you all are in. Uh, and thank you for what you do to help sm the small businesses sort of succeed in that realm. Well, you know, I'll add one thing, and if there's one more question, we'll take it. Um, I really feel like we've returned to being an artisan society, you know, like we were in the 1700s. You know, we had the, uh, the blacksmith, uh, you know, who would get his tools, you know, repaired from one place. He would get his wood from another place. And everybody played a role in the, in the community. And what's happening today is that you're seeing a lot more of these startups. You can start a business, an international business, and run it out of your house. You know, uh, there, are, there are services like Elance or Odesk. Uh, you know, I told a friend of mine was having trouble. He was, he, 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 you know, he had a PowerPoint that he had to deliver to clients and is really struggling with it. And I, I told him, I said, you, why don't you go to Elance or Odesk? They'll do it for you. You bid it out and, you know, you, you can pay $75 for a PowerPoint presentation. You know, they'll show you what the rates are going on, the, on those sites. 
And uh, he, he wrote me back the next day. He goes, that was the greatest sight that I've ever seen in my life. I sent it. This woman in Arizona bid on it. We're like best friends now. And he said, I'm going to send so much business her way because there are so many people like me who struggle with PowerPoint. That's, that's kind of where I think I see a lot of opportunities is that for if you're starting a business, you can outsource so much of the stuff that you hate to do whether it's financing, marketing, IT, and you can, you can focus on the things that you love to do. Um, there was a great book, it's called Go It Alone. Um, I can't remember the guy who wrote it. He was a Yale professor and I actually saw him speak, I think, I saw him speak in Baltimore. And I saw him speak at the ASBDC. Fantastic book, but he talks about the only people you should hire as uh, a business owner are revenue generators and you should outsource everything else and let those people, so if you're a plumber, hire other plumbers and then outsource the back end of your business and let the people do what they do best. So just food for thought. We are right up against, uh, it's about 11.58. Does anybody, would love to get one more question if you have it. We're good to go. Thank you all. Yeah, hey, last minute plugs, uh, sba.gov. Uh, we also manage businessusa.gov. So any type of huh. public data set or future, you don't know which darn federal agency works in a particular category, businessusa.gov. I'm at Bianco, my last name on Twitter. If you ever have a question, I'll get you connected to the right person in your market or specialist in our entire network. And he's at John A. Meyer on Twitter, and I'm at Brian Moran. We all got in early, so we were able to get our names. So thank you all very much.